We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I would like to welcome our distinguished guests, Mrs. Katarzyna Szymilewicz, President of Panopticon Foundation. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Marcin Krasuski, Government uh, Affairs and Public Policy Manager at Google. Hello, everyone. As well as two guests who are with us online, Frederick Eriksson, Director of European Center for Political Economy. Hi, Frederick. Okay, I, I see Frederick here. Okay, he's waving, he's, he's with us. And Ms. Marta Pawlak, um, Public Policy Manager of Startup Poland. Hello everyone, great to see you here. Hi. So maybe I'll just skip through the, the primary reason why, why we have gathered here today. So obviously every, everyone knows regulation of digital markets is on top of the most important um, agendas in globally. So it is the topic of utter importance for the IMF, WTO, World Bank and the EU. In recent years, only at the level of the European Union, a number of regulations aiming at the, re the, re the regulation of digital markets has been proposed. So we have seen actually since 2018, at least seven, and this is a very not exhaustive list, we can count together. So that would be the 2018 ND4 uh, applicability of the GDPR, then in 2020 P2B, and in 2021 there is already Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, Data Act, Data Governance Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, and 2022 will actually see a number of new regulations being proposed by the Commission. So these will include the uh, Cyber Resilience Act, as well as the Single Market Emergency Instrument. While the number might not be conclusive here, uh, the issue of proposing so many regulations is concerning for two primary reasons. First, new regulations are being proposed before the time needed for the effective um, impact assessment of the previous ones has elapsed. This is the case with actually Digital Markets Act and P2B regulations that both um, regulate the terms of cooperation between large online platforms and business users. And second, we actually see the scopes of these regulations overlapping. For instance, the topic of illegal content is regulated at the same time in Terrorist Content Online, Copyright Directive and Digital Services Act. But enough of this, uh, my first question would be to Katarzyna is how, how did we actually get here and why do we need so many regulations in the first place? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me for this discussion. Thank you for proposing um, a very bold statements to start with. Uh, while I might sympathize with them and even agree that that inflation of new regulations and lack of time for impact assessment is an issue, especially for business that has to comply and invest a lot of money in compliance, but also for users who also might ha have reasons to feel lost. Um, I really cannot explain uh, why it happens because I'm not representing European Commission that would be, um, I guess, um, uh, able to may maybe say something more about wh why. Um, if you ask me why, uh, I would like to see that market regulated. I'm not saying regulated with so many different instruments and in such a rushed way. 
uh, not not that definitely, but I would like to see that market regulated for a very basic reason. Um, we have enough evidence collected over past two decades that the current existing dominating business model uh, of online platforms, which fund their um, activities with advertising and not just any advertising, but most specifically behavioral advertising, which requires constant observation of internet users, usually beyond their control and awareness, that business model does cause harm on individual level for these users and on societal level for us as community, uh, be that in the shape of disinformation, polarization, radicalization of the debates, um, and various other uh, indirect impacts that hurt our democratic structures, the quality of public media, public health. I'm now thinking about well digital well-being being, being uh, at stake and people getting more and more uh, not just used to, but simply addicted to certain interfaces, not services, but interfaces. The, the, the design of the interface would be an issue here. So there are many reasons why I would say we need regulation. The big question is what regulation and at what pace. So I understand, my understanding is that European Commission tries to react uh, to these harms that are being mapped as we speak and because these harms are revealed not all in once and we didn't have good documentation good evidence 10 years back when gdpr was in the making and before even eu started regulating platforms as such but they are revealed um when the whistleblowing happens or when there are there are, there are breakthroughs in the debate so to say that are not dependent on the commission and I can imagine European Commission is under the pressure to react to this uh, affairs that um, are part of the public debate every now and then. So they need to show that they care about citizens and they care about other business entities that might be harmed in these business models by the dominant players, right? Um, whether they react timely, whether they react with preparation, it's hard to say. I can imagine that being European legislator, when you have to react, you have to start doing something and doing something is regulating because that's basically the, the toolkit you have. Uh, and if you want to wait for impact assessment, if you want to wait for evidence being verified and for very strong analysis showing what exactly the problem is and how exactly should we react, you might simply miss your chance. I often hear comments, critical comments towards EU exactly on these grounds. Why you come so late? Why you haven't reacted before these harms happened? And we can always say, well, okay, technology is never waiting, right? We, we've been immersed, all of us, including businesses, we are all immersed in a certain technological environment where things simply happen. They've been happening over the past two decades, but only now we see full scale of the harm. It is on one hand, it seems too late to regulate. On the other hand, I would agree with you that inflation of these papers and lack of time for assessing them is hugely problematic. So how do we go about that? It's, it's, a, it's a very tricky political dilemma, which maybe we can discuss today. Thank you. So today we also have representative of Big Tech. And I would like to ask Martin, how does Google find itself in a in a regulatory environment that is changing so dramatically quickly. And how do you respond to these concerns that we have discussed now? Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I think that growing the large number of regulatory acts and schemes is a, is a growing uh, issue for all companies. It's not only for big tech, but all companies that uh, have to comply with uh, raising costs, with additional uh, constraints on their businesses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is this is nothing new. Uh, there is even a saying that, for example, in US, uh, US they, in the US they have GAFAM, meaning the most uh, the, the the biggest online platforms. But in the EU, we have produced GDPR, for example. And I'm not saying that this is something bad, because no one is saying that we should get rid of these uh, regulatory acts. Everyone would like to uh, see their data being protected. Everyone would like to see harmful 
content or violent content uh, which is somehow mitigated online that our kids are uh, are uh, protected as well our consumer rights so all of this is okay and we at at google when we look at it uh, what we see is that what we would like to see in, in, in the EU is finally a completion of digital sin, single market. So we see different regulatory attempts and at different member states trying to regulate the same things. For example, what is allowed online and what is banned. And we have different uh, obligations imposed on us. So we have we have to comply with it on, on different basis. We, ha we have the same content can be judged differently in Poland and in Germany. And this poses quite, raises a lot of concern for us because we, as you probably are aware, we operate at scale. So uh, when we see an attempt to harmonize the rules, uh, to provide to, to provide um, to provide same conditions uh, how we operate across different member states then we obviously we are we are happy with it and not only us but also smaller businesses because even though we operate at scale and at and a lot of different issues come at scale uh, but small companies also benefit from the same rules because they cannot uh, allow themselves to spend a lot of money on compliance. There were numerous studies that are, were actually demonstrating how unjust burden uh, was levied on small uh, enterprises when they had to comply with GDPR. And so we are seeing more or less the same thing uh, in the big tech world. And uh, I would need to come back to one thing that uh, Katarzyna mentioned is about uh, the, 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 the evidence for the uh, ads uh, being harmful to the society. We see this completely differently. Uh, we at Google, we, um, we basically, we earn majority of our revenues come from uh, targeted ads and we do not see that we are only benefiting at our, uh, on, on our own, but also a lot of small companies that rely on internet advertising, they can reach new, to, uh, new markets, new, new customers, uh, sell their own services or products using targeted ads. And this is not only good for them, but also for consumers. Just think about this. If you are interested in, for example, shoes, then you... I think you would benefit from ads showing you shoes and not, for example, maps. Uh, so I, th I think that because of that, uh, a lot of users can uh, basically save their time. Same with press. A lot of independent, local, regional press is mainly funded by ads. And since majority of news we, uh, we consume right now is online, most of these revenues come from online advertising. So when I hear that kind of claims, I, uh, I do not fully agree with this. And obviously there are, uh, there are issues with polarization, but do they come from targeted advertising? I'm not so sure. Uh, Katarzyna said that uh, a there is a lot of polarization right now online. This is true. But is it caused by targeted advertising? I'm not so sure. The polarization online, in our opinion, in my opinion, it stems from mostly from uh, polarization and divisions which are already present in different parts of, of, of societies. And these are only reflected online. We can argue that these can be reinforced online, obviously. And this is completely different uh, discussion that uh, we can have and should have about what kind of content users see so uh, so they do not end up in these different rabbit holes so they can see good content or valuable content and not only harmful content and but, but that kind of discussions we are open to have but let's do not overreact and let's not ban altogether targeted advertising because this is highly beneficial for the whole economy thank you very much Thank you, Martin. And before I go to uh, our next panelist, I would just like to uh, underline and invite everyone to ask questions uh, when they have some. So, um, yes. But 
coming back to uh, our discussion, Martin has already showed um, kind of a, a landscape that things that we consider to be digital and to be online do not necessarily always just touch on the large technology providers, but they are intertwined very deeply with our society. So they have influence on entrepreneurs on press and on very many other sectors. So now I would like to ask Marta actually, um, does this premise that digital regulations influence only the big technological um, players holds true in the startup community? How does these regulations influence those, the smallest and most innovative players? Uh, hello everyone, again thank you very much for inviting me here um, and thank you Martin for, uh, for referring to startups um, and uh, the price uh, they could possibly pay for uh, implementation new regulations. Uh, me and Martin were on I think at least one panel together with uh, startups uh, representatives um, when we asked them to, to refer to new upcoming regulations and um, to, to try to answer the question uh, how these regulations targeted at large companies so will probably influence them. And of course, uh, always new legal acts uh, being around the corner uh, mean time necessary to, to implement them and financial cost for, for companies, uh, which is uh, more harmful for, for startups permanently uh, struggling to, to build value uh, with uh, limited resources, of course, and then for big companies. Uh, and now in the time of COVID, it's even more painful because uh, many startups uh, business models are already hurt by, by, by the crisis. But coming back to this uh, digital regulations, of course, as Martin mentioned, um, startups uh, do not have uh, enough resources very often uh, to, to spend money on marketing costs and they use uh, very widely um, the tools uh, that are offered by, by large platforms. Uh, Martin mentioned a targeted advertising and uh, we examined a lot of startups asking uh, what marketing tools uh, they're using. And the answer was simple, targeted advertising. So uh, definitely taking away or even limited um, option of this uh, will be very, very harmful for, uh, for uh, startups. Uh, and I can give you, for instance, uh, an example of um, online supermarket that is run by startup that uh, makes sure uh, that uh, the items sold on its website are secure and has implemented all necessary legal safeguards and, and measures. Uh, and with any marketplace, it can happen that products uh, can be recalled for uh, one several reasons. And on the principle that uh, what is illegal uh, offline should be illegal online that is trying to be implemented by DSA if I remember correctly the liability burden should not wait more on uh, online uh, supermarkets for instance that um, as they are uh, intermediary and do not control the products uh, on the, of their suppliers so so making startup online supermarket liable would add obligations and end up uh, making it harder for uh, making it harder <coughs> sorry something wrong with my voice <coughs> for a small uh, local uh, sellers or imagine a startup uh, which allows uh, consumers to review any company or service that a startup wants to be comply with uh, new regulations digital regulation from day one uh, but the latest uh, provisions discussed in the uh, European uh, Commission and the Parliament would prove it difficult uh, if it's not impossible to comply with uh, because uh, establishing a uh, threshold, policymakers create a glass ceiling that uh, uh, discourages scaling. And um, knowing that even before uh, launching its business, the startup will have to implement an internal complaint mechanism or, or a trusted uh, flagger system, remove illegal content in uh, 24 hours and uh, randomly check its products or services. And of course, it will, uh, it will, uh, it will be uh, not helpful for for startup from uh, launching uh, in the first place. And uh, one one more thing to highlight that I think, of course, uh, startup Poland, we we all agree uh, that um, all these um, digital regulations should be adopted to the new uh, reality. Uh, but uh, they also should be proportionate for startups because uh, startups have uh, different 
uh, possibilities and different risk exposure. So, so uh, we think that new regulations can be a big win for startups, but uh, we have to um, write them, design them uh, to be not, not to destroy startups business. Thank you so much. So we have heard a lot about the undue regulatory burden that is being imposed on smaller companies. And as I have mentioned in the beginning, now there is really a plethora of new acts which will cause a great compliance costs and basically change certain business models. So this has an impact on the entire economy. And now I would like to ask Frederick, how, what is the outlook for the EU's economy, keeping in mind the developments that we are speaking about? So f first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, join you for this panel. I'm sorry I can't be in Katowice today. Um, the, I mean, the question you, that you put, I think it's a fundamental question. And it can be addressed in many different ways. I think one of the first thing we need to acknowledge is that Europe is now choosing to have sort of a level of restrictions on commercial behavior, on innovation behavior online, which is different from what you can see in many other major markets in the world. Um, this obviously is going to have a consequence on the decisions by firms where they're going to locate new innovations, new technologies, and where they will invest in uh, new types of commercial behavior. And I think this is probably one of the one uh, consequences on the economy that European policymakers need to be aware of. Um, if you go through, for instance, with the Digital Markets Act, um, and you put on a lot of restrictions on what gatekeeper platforms can do, it's not that they're going to stop doing things. They're not going to stop innovate. They're not going to stop trying to uh, use data in much more efficient ways in order to deliver more value to users. It's just that it's not going to happen in Europe. It's going to happen elsewhere. So you get a reallocation of investment and innovation um, when you choose to have a level of restrictiveness um, in Europe that is different from the rest of the world. And I think that this adds to some of the problems that we already have. We know, for instance, that um, many startups in the digital space, they tend to migrate out of Europe uh, once they reach uh, a level when they are uh, going to get more dependent on growth financing and uh, an expansion of uses that um, becomes more easy to do in other parts of the world than in Europe. If you look at, for instance, investment in AI, uh, Europe is far behind United States and China when it comes to how much money that is being invested in it, which is partly a consequence of, of uh, differences in regulatory approach. So um, what we can expect here is that when Europe goes ahead with even more restrictions now in what you've mentioned already, for instance, uh, the DSA, when you look at the AI regulation or when you um, go into other, other regulatory proposals, we should expect that this will have a consequence on the choice of firms where they're going to start, where they're going to expand and how they're going to experiment with new technology and new innovations. And this, to me, is, is, is the most fundamental aspect of it, and it goes to the heart of, of some of the conversations that you've already had, which is that I don't see a point in going ahead with different economic regulations. I think we can have, I think there's sort of a perfectly good case to even improve and sharpen some of the regulations that we have on, for instance, consumer protection. Uh, we can do a lot more on regulations that concerns consumer harms, perhaps even mental harm, for instance, by having age controls on social media. But we are not doing that. We're going ahead with regulations that are much more economically oriented, and they deal much more with uh, the market and with competition than it deals with the actual uh, problems that we are confronted with. And this is partly a consequence of the fact that 
um, we don't have a European policy or a European mandate to do these things. Uh, Marsden mentioned, for instance, when it comes to definitions of illegal content and how it varies between different uh, countries in the EU. That's absolutely true. And it's a consequence of the fact that we don't have a European free speech, free speech code. What is allowed to be said in one country uh, may be uh, unlawful to be said in another country. And since the EU cannot go in, and, and give a clear legal definition of what constitutes legal content, they try to move with market regulation instead in order to achieve the same thing. So that's where we get the DSA and we get sort of the threat of big penalties if um, platforms aren't removing uh, not just illegal content, but what could be harmful content and what could plausibly uh, be content uh, that could that could be illegal or harmful um, as well. So it's a choice which is being made not because it's the rational way of going about regulation. It's a choice that is being made simply because we lack the tools uh, in the European Union to deal with um, um, some of the more fundamental aspects of illegal content. I think this is highly unfortunate because when you move with economic regulations, you do get a lot of economic consequences, exactly those that already have been pointed to by, by Marta, which is that if, if there is a threat of a big penalty, if you're not remove content fast enough, what is platforms going to do? Well, they're going to remove a lot more than they need to remove simply because uh, they want to reduce the risks. And we've already seen this in lots of different uh, uh, regulations that have been introduced in the digital space over the past 10 years, which is that uh, now we have big platforms um, becoming censorious and removing far more than they should do, simply because they're afraid that uh, they may get a high penalty uh, if they don't remove it, and because it is going to cost too much to go into each and every uh, content of, of a posting or of something which has been put online in order to figure out if this is on the right side or the wrong side of the law. So that's why we're going to get these consequences that Marta pointed to, which is that, you know, things like Facebook market, for instance, it's just impossible for Facebook to control each and everything which is being put up for sale on Facebook markets by an individual. So they're going to take away the opportunity to do so for uh, sellers that are uh, too small to motivate taking the cost in order to inspect and see uh, what type of products that they are putting there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can see that we have some questions. Could I please ask the IT support uh, to open the Q&A? Uh, of course. Um, then could you please go forward with your uh, advotum and we will try to... Yes, okay, so uh, we will have a Katarzyna with a comment. We'll figure out the questions that we have on chat that were first and then we'll proceed with your questions. Okay, thank you. Because I, I was speaking first, maybe it's not natural actually that I'm the only representative of uh, civil society and uh, then came uh, voices from industry. So I feel I need to address some of the claims and concerns uh, before we open the discussion. So let me um, insert three comments uh, at, at the bottom. Um, first, uh, my colleagues speak about innovation and uh, um, that race to, to, to the bottom when it comes to user value started by um, big tech, but joined by startups to innovate in a way that is disturbing for, for consumers, human beings, that this is how we frame it. And the, the, the key thing here is what is at stake in this race? If you innovate for the sake of innovating or for the sake of your profit, you have to include the fact that people will not like to be affected by the results of that innovation. If people endorse uh, the business model. If people have nothing against your business models, they will also not ask for you to be more regulated, right? So if I was in the shoes of, of my colleagues from industry, I would be asking myself a question, what is wrong with my business model that so many people, citizens, 
consumer organizations, human rights organizations, media, regulators across the world, not only Europe. Remember what happens in the US. For last two to three years, we keep hearing very concerned voices from the US, including Silicon Valley, including former key investors in uh, online business models who have been at the very beginning of Facebooks and others calling for regulations, saying, how come we allowed for this toxic business model to develop to the extent we can no, no longer con contain it? The US now seems to regret they didn't have GDPR before. Why so? Is it because everybody wants to innovate and just make more money and only consumers are grumpy? I mean, come on, let's face it. Like if people wanted to be exploited, they wouldn't ask for you to be regulated, right? So if I was industry, on the industry side, on the business side, I would try to imagine the logic of people who actually come and ask for more regulation. What is behind their claims. And now, uh, if it was so easy to isolate major harms and just regulate point by point, we would have done that. We tried. GDPR was such an attempt among many others. But what came out of the whistleblowing of the many debates I mentioned already in the US, in the EU, around major platforms, the business model is at stake. The business model is the issue. The advertising founded business model is, uh, big, and not because of advertising as such, and I will come back to this. It's very important to differentiate the algorithms and the logic of targeting people based on their intrinsic hidden um, virtues, features that they are not comfortable in revealing and having exploited. This is uh, an issue which is common for advertising, specific type of advertising, not every advertising, uh, not every type of advertising, and for profile content. This is why I conflate the two, talking about social harms, talking about mental harms, about um, digital well-being, which is at stake, but also radicalization, polarization that Martin um, mentioned in his uh, remarks. I'm not saying advertising is to blame for this. I'm saying the same business logic, which is aimed at engagement, or fundamentally it requires constant user engagement and profiling and, uh, and uh, um, trying to engage people actually against their own digital well-being. This is that part of the business model that needs to be fixed. And you cannot do it without addressing the business model. This is why we have DMA and DSA, which is trying to do exactly that. Whether this is radical or not, I wouldn't say so. In the current draft that I hope we all, all have read from last week, there is nothing radical in these propositions. Why? Maybe because big tech was, was so violently lobbying against it with success. And this is what I also want to say in this debate, that if we are concerned about startups and small business, I would talk more to the biggest companies, to the leaders on this market, to stop misbehaving. Because unfortunately, the misbehavior of the leading companies and their lobbying against fundamental restrictions uh, cause harm in smaller players, right? I hear the voice of concerned smaller industry players, but you pay the price for um, harmful behavior of the biggest ones who abuse uh, people's data at scale and cause this public outcry that then has this trickle down, um, kind of negative trickle down effect on the whole market. So I would encourage more debate within the industry against most harmful practices, like it happened in industry, in, in advertising industry itself, when we, we all recall this very irritating type of advertising that was trying to catch people's att attention at any price with, with voice, with you know just coming uh, uh, with sound and everything very irritating. It was self-regulated. It was simple to self-regulate. Same advertising targeted kids uh, openly. It was self-regulated effectively, but that was simple. Now we have to address something far more complicated, which is covered, um, non-transparent, invisible for normal users, type of targeting that is exploiting uh, human behavior and human vulnerabilities. This is the, the problem, not advertising as such. I truly believe that all the examples that Martin mentioned and Marta mentioned, they could operate legally without any restrictions because these are not the harmful examples. Let's talk about harmful examples of what needs to be fixed rather than um, move that debate to extreme like ban advertising or not. Nobody is saying is proposing a ban on advertising, not me at least, but let's really address what is toxic in the business model of the biggest players and 
through that prevent harmful regulation for the whole market. Thank you so much, Katarzyna. It's actually amazing that you said that because my next question was exactly about that. So I wanted to ask you to explain why targeted advertising is a threat and why it concerns us. So no, but you, I guess you. It's not about targeting as such. It's about spe spe specific type of targeting, which is not including user's choice. So what we propose to be constructive, we say, let's fix the opt-in. Let's really do the GDPR already, um, according to GDPR, in my interpretation of the GDPR, targeted advertising based on behavior or data requires opt-in anyway. But we all know how opt-in is done these days. Yes, it is not really any form of consent or at least informed consent. So if we face that uh, together, if we innovate on that field, I truly believe, truly believe that industry is capable of innovating here and proposing to people some kind of interface that really engages with the user and asks two questions or in two steps. Of course, we are not talking about pop-ups. It has to be designed better than pop-ups. So first, do you want to opt in for advertising targeted based on your behavior? If not, it only means you will get contextual advertising or advertising targeted based on your uh, on the profile that you authorized, yes? So we are only talking about specific opt-in for the most invisible, non-transparent type of advertising. And then if the user, if the human being affected tells us, yes, I'm ready for that, then we ask that human to specify what features they are comfortable in having targeted at them. And now we have consumer value, user choice, everything you mentioned, but truly fulfilled and not just rhetoric. Thank you so much. Uh, could we have the questions, please, from the Q&A on the Zoom? Could you please open them? We can't, we can't see them here. Yeah, OK. Um, so a uh, gentleman from the room who wanted to ask the question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. May I have a mic or? Yeah. Oh, there is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Jan Zygmuntowski, Kozminski University. Um, I'd like to be as polite as possible, but I just need to call out the massive disinformation that was said during this panel, and I will say it very precisely. For example, Frederick said that gatekeepers are not going to stop innovating. My question, based on what really is in Digital Markets Act, is do you mean that discriminating third-party products and favoring your own in algorithms is innovation. Do you mean that? This is the precise letter of the law. Or that cu cutting off SMEs from app stores is innovation. This is the truth, not some vague speech about harming innovation. How regulation that is supposed to be antitrust, pro-competitiveness, harms startups is the other way around. This is fake, what you're saying. And I want and a final question, question to Marcin. Belgian Data Protection Authority has just declared that the transparency and consent framework used by AIB and also by Google is not compliant with GDPR. So when are you going to delete all the data that was captured using this framework, which is not compliant with European law? And how do you intend to do it? What is the action plan? This is the question from me. Okay, thank you very much for your question. So um, maybe because the first part was addressed to Frederick. So Frederick, would you like to answer? All right, I can do that. Thank you for the attribution of being fake and coming with fake news. So yeah. the, the DMA itself does a lot of things. Um, Self-preferencing is one of them and um, other things you mentioned, sort of um, access to app stores, etc. Um, that's part sort of, of the broad intention of not just the DMA, but of course of competition policy cases, which has already been um, subject to um, court uh, decisions and court reviews in, in, in the EU. Uh, but it does a lot more. Um, it goes in to deal with interoperability issues. It goes in to deal with use of data uh, when you combine your own data with um, um, data that doesn't come from your core platform service or data that you've been obtaining from a third party. 
um, it goes in to provide um, uh, at least um, in the abstract um, uh, restrictions when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Um, so the DMA is a very, very broad package. Now, um, the question I put forward to you is basically, um, are other countries in the world going to choose the same type of regulation as the EU has done now with the DMA? And my answer is, is no. Um, you can just compare the DMA, for instance, to what is being proposed in the UK. You can look at the uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the proposal in the US Senate, which is most, most likely to become sort of the, uh, the core proposal for how the United States uh, prepared to deal with platform regulations. And you find there are significant differences between them, which are going to have a consequence on, on innovation. Uh, and by innovation, I basically mean um, how you're going to come forward with new type of um, services with new type of products. Uh, what type of space that you allow for, um, for companies to, to do that and to try to figure out um, um, what they think consumers are going to uh, favor in the future. So um, looking at sort of some of the potential consequences of the DMA, we don't know because everything is so vaguely formulated in the DMA at this point that it's just impossible to try to figure out what the practical, practical consequences are going to be uh, when you start to apply this. Uh, it may be, to reference, for instance, Morrison's companies, may be that it's just going to be impossible to... Uh, use uh, Google search in order to find um, uh, a choice of a restaurant in a city where you get reviews from other people that have been to this restaurant or where you're going to get a map uh, to show you how to get to that particular restaurant. It may be that uh, Amazon cannot continue with it, its current model and that it has to become a lot more like eBay uh, in, in its entire offering, simply because um, uh, the way that Amazon is restricting its users and the way it disc discriminates in terms of what behavior that is allowed on its platform um, is most likely at odds with um, lots of things that um, uh, we can see uh, in, in the DMA. So the entire notion that the DMA itself is going to lead to a lot of consumer value, uh, I think that's a highly debatable proposition. And, uh, and my problem with it is, is that uh, not just that we are most likely going to find sort of a reallocation where new innovation, new technologies, new products will be introduced in other parts of the world, but not in Europe. Um, it is also that most likely we are going to reduce the usefulness of platforms in Europe, leading to uh, a much more fragmented and also uh, a much more complex type of, of, of online market where you cannot sort of compete in ways that you would be allowed to compete uh, if you were doing it offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frederick. And maybe also just to underline, I think it's important to note here that no one here is disputing the idea and the need to introduce those digital regulations. Uh, the idea is rather to discuss and to see, as proposed in the title of this debate, different perspectives and different voices in order to make those regulations better. So, so far we have, uh, I don't know if there is a question from lady in the back. Okay. Hi, thanks very much. I wanted to share my perspective. Uh, I'm coming from the UK from Ofcom, which is the communications regulator, but it, you might be able to tell by my accent that I'm actually American. Um, first, I wanted to point out that um, the kind of the idea that we could address certain harms, uh, such as online harms, which is what the UK is trying to tackle in a, the online safety bill, uh, kind of divorced from or in a vacuum that doesn't necessarily imply economic impacts on companies is false. So one of the things that we have to consider uh, as an independent regulator is the proportionality of interventions in terms of how they will impact companies. 
So you'd be surprised. Things like age verification can have a huge and disproportionate impact on particularly the smallest platforms because it's something that benefits from economies of scale. The more users you have, the cheaper it is to have each kind of age assurance or age verification check. So I just wanted to point that out. And I also think that we might be looking at the same glass of water in terms of similarities or differences and saying one's half full and one's half empty when we're thinking about um, how the DMA compares to parallel legislation in the UK or indeed the kind of thought that is brewing in the United States. So of course there are plenty of differences in the way that people think about it or the history or the case law uh, in which it has to exist. But I do think that there's a, quite a lot of um, really interesting parallels and similarities uh, between the three of the, you know, between these three uh, geographic areas. Um, particularly, I mean, the CMA, the, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK is quite aligned with, um, with a lot of the thinking in Brussels. Uh, and it looks like the FTC is kind of trailing that in that direction, towards that direction rather than away. Um, but I think, I think it's also worth, um, yeah, I, I just think I think we need to really zero in on those kinds of similarities and, and see where we what we have in common, because I think that that's equally as interesting. And because we are all trying to regulate this global internet, internet, uh, the kind of the need for uh, international cooperation and uh, regulatory cooperation, it, it's the only way that we're going to be able to do this effectively. So uh, if we think about innovation in terms of not just in terms of who can come and exist in the existing um, economic platform uh, economy, so in the existing um, ad-based market, but innovation in terms of uh, what kinds of new products and services or indeed business models can we try to, um, try to create through things like safety by design guidance, business support mechanisms. Uh, I think our civil society colleague made a really great point about uh, innovation doesn't necessarily have to be, um, you know, there, there is a social component here. It's not a strictly economic uh, proposition. And we are seeing a lot of, um, a lot of issues of trust in uh, existing business models. So as a regulator, it's just thinking about how can you be proportionate on, on existing economies, but also maybe spur innovation in things like safety tech or things like privacy by design. What does this look like? And I think by providing guide rails and uh, proportionate interventions, we might be able to help spur that. Um, across many different countries. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I really love that intervention, especially that it kind of got us to the next stage in our debate, meaning how can we get from the stage of complaining about what we don't like to the stage of how can we make those regulations better. So we have, so far we have talked about digital regulations in general, uh, because well, it's important that we not only think about, for instance, people are working on DMA and they've know only DMA, but they don't get, they, they grasp the extent of changes that are happening. Uh, but nevertheless, we have seen one issue emerging that has actually uh, emerged across uh, a few of these regulations, meaning targeted advertising. So targeted advertising was primarily supposed to be dealt with in the IA Act, but then it was proposed to be in the, the included in the DSA and the DMA. So now we obviously we have heard also about the or the, the problems related to targeting and advertising and the the risk that it it brings uh, but i would like to ask martin so how could how could we actually make this this regulation workable and addressing the the risk mentioned yeah thank you very much for the spirited debate and for the questions asked so maybe if i may start from the targeted ads and uh, question from the audience so i'm uh, i'm, I'm tr i truly believe that we, at google we are compliant with gdpr and uh, and but we saw different regulatory activities popping up in different member states uh trying to question our compliance and how the new technologies are really in line with the gdpr etc but these are emerging discussions uh, and we are not uh, avoiding them. We are uh, actually engaging with regulators to discuss this. We are even proposing measures on our own. For example, uh, there is from next year, actually, we will introduce a ban on third party cookies. Uh, this was actually a ban that is supposed to strengthen the consumer so that its data, his or hers da data will be uh, completely secure and will be managed in, uh, only by Google and not by third companies. But then, uh, so this is truly motivated to actually to protect consumer. 
but then on the other hand, then we would immediately be accused of undermining competitive competition and competitive uh, our competitors on uh, online so you can just see how difficult it is to to balance all the all, all the different interests online and we understand at google that we are a global company and with uh, global press presence and with the size comes uh, bigger bigger responsibility so uh we try to actually to measure our imp impact on society on culture on on the other on other companies um and uh, but it, it is difficult and someone asked in the chat i saw the question whether the, the right way uh the right approach would be to basically to focus on big tech on gatekeepers on vlops whatever the name is or maybe we should cover all companies, all startups with the same rules. And as I said, this is difficult because at the same time, we understand that since our size, we have bigger impact, we reach more people. So if something goes wrong on our services and there is a harmful content, it reaches wider audiences. But then we ban it and then we see the same content popping up on different platforms. Uh, we saw this in, for example, on the 6th of January with, uh, with Capitol Hill riots, where uh, that kind of content was banned on YouTube, but it, it popped up on, on, on other places. Uh, so for us, the rules should be harmonized. The rules should be, uh, should be the same, if possible, for all players. And, uh, and I think that is the message that I would like to convey to you. And on top of that, please remember that we are at IGF, which motto is Internet United. And let's try to imagine good old days where Internet was truly one and we could have the same experience no matter where we joined uh, uh, online. And let's try to avoid splinterness because this is where we are heading. So we will have different Internet in US, in, in China, in Iran, in European Union. And I don't really know if it's, that's the right uh, way forward. So that's, that's why we, for example, are truly happy to see new ways of discussing uh, internet regulations across the Atlantic, for example. Uh, this year, there was Trade and Technology Council launched uh, by the government of US and uh, European policymakers. And in, in, in view of you know streamlining the, the regulatory the discussions and uh, harmonizing them and we are looking forward to see a, a fruitful outcome out of this so we'll see thank you thank you uh, Marta I would like to ask you um, so how could we make these regulations more workable for a startup community what will help uh, not over-regulating, I would say, uh, in the first place. Um, and of course, we are. Uh, this is the world we are living in, and, and uh, we are surrounded by law. And I'm saying this as a legal counsel. Uh, but uh, at Startup Poland, since 2015, yes. Seven, yeah, 2015, um, uh, we develop um, a survey among startups, uh, trying to trying to answer the question uh, what makes um, successful a startup successful and what makes a struggling startup struggling and and um, this uh, survey every year shows that uh, the biggest um, barrier in running startup uh, is our legal barriers so uh, changing very quickly legal environment uh, the necessity to, to be compliant with as we mentioned many times here uh, is uh, is huge problem for startups and uh, as i as i said many times and, and as we heard from frederick katarzyna and, and martin uh, the, all these regulations uh, especially in the digital world uh, we are discussing today uh, have to be adopted and changed uh, but maybe we should uh, we should uh, listen more startups during uh, regulating a uh, new era and uh, take uh, their positions and situations into considerations because i do not agree with, with uh, what martin said that uh, all rules should be the same um, as i said before uh, risk exposure and and possibilities and resources are different uh, for uh, for different kinds of companies and i don't think that competition law is an answer here um like i don't know there are people who are paying uh, higher taxes and we should maybe treat this um, as the incentive for startups, the, the, the fact that we have different uh, legal uh, rules for them and uh, it, it happens um, 
already because at least in Poland uh, during last year uh, we had uh, some not so bad regulations regarding uh, innovation uh, innovation innovative ecosystem and and startups um, uh, anyway uh, we are trying to answer the question uh, how how we have to stop being uh, wall of cry and and make uh, make digital regulations workable for startups. I will refer mostly to DSA, I think, because this is uh, this is uh, something we uh, discussed very often among startups, and uh, we examine this uh, together with our uh, European partners, like for instance, Allied for Startups Organization. Uh, and I, I prepared the, the the list for Santa Claus for today. So so our answer is uh, continue to to, to uh, limit platforms liability for a third party content uh, posted to their site and, and uh, uh, the transactions uh, they facilitate. Uh, design procedural obligations uh, with uh, known penalties, uh, such as notice and act system that could increase uh, trust for, for business users and consumers. Uh, uh, increase the awareness and consistency of, of rules applied across the EU by extending the country of origin. This is very important, country of origin principle to the broadest possible range of legal requirements. And we didn't refer to this uh, before, but uh, but this is a very important uh, postulate for from, from startups. And um, avoid uh, information burdens and then uh, discourage uh, business users uh, because this is really problematic for, for startups and, and uh, detailed verifications of each action taken on the platform uh, from startups can be, can be, can be a very uh, difficult. So, uh, but do not overregulate this is in the first place and do it very smartly with, uh, with uh, the presence of startups on the table. Thank you so much. So now, Katarzyna, <coughs> if you have the magic <coughs> wand, to, to make to fix all the all the things and the digital regulation no i will not even try because we have three minutes left and we are talking about a huge range of obligations and rules and i don't want to make them sound naive or or ridiculous like uh, um like maybe we okay let me rephrase, rephrase. The, the, the my big worry uh, represented in this debate here is that we usually have so little time and so few stakeholders and so such a huge space to discuss uh, not just in this room in many other possible rooms including brussels rooms when it happens that there is this tendency to focus on one issue like we did today on targeted advertising and make it extreme, make it sound extreme rather than go into more sophisticated details like the Ofcom colleague in, in her excellent comment showed that you, know, you can frame uh, innovation, for example, in the context of consumer safety or building trust and you can just discuss this for one year, right? We have the time that time usually comes after regulation is in place with gdpr we had many years to do exactly that to take these rules rules because it's it's principle based regulation it's not detailed it's not going into solutions right it's just giving rules for business players and these rules could have been interpreted to the benefit of both i believe consumer value and uh, ethical business. Has it been interpreted like this? Have we here invested any time really in a dialogue across consumer organizations, uh, regulators like Ofcom in UK that is mediating more than punishing uh, small industry, startups, designers, uh, big tech, have we? This is not happening. So you're asking me the question about how to fix regulation. I have no idea how to fix that mess. Don't blame me for this mess. I, the, the, the more I listen to this debate today, I'm actually more convinced that that should be, it, it is, the ball is on the pitch of, of businesses here to start a real dialogue with consumer organizations, human rights organizations, but also designers and regulators to actually fix the harms that their business model is causing before the next wave of reg regulation comes. I'm sorry, colleagues, but your um, lack of uh, presence in this debate caused that inflation. If you reacted to concerns that were voiced years ago around uh, opt-ins, around irritating pop-ups, around harms that have been resurfacing years ago, you wouldn't have that mess with regulation. So we better start talking, not like today, with one civil society, you know, to pay the lip service, but like honestly talking about solutions that are based on trust and consumer value. 
Thank you. And now, Frederick, you have one our last minute for your concluding remarks and maybe some ideas how to fix this mess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't. I don't think I have a, a good solution either. Um, I think what 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 is important is that we sort of we continue with applying uh, our normal competition policy in the way that we have done uh, for the past two decades. And it is achieving results. It's achieving positive results. Um, I think we, with regulation, we want to encourage more competition, more contestability. We want more competition between the big platforms. Um, we want, um, you know, for the sake of argument, Apple to start uh, activities much more in search to compete with uh, Google, for instance. We want more competition with, say, Apple extending its App Store to include uh, markets and transactions that you normally would find in Amazon. We want more of that type of competition because it's going to be helpful for uh, consumers, it's going to be helpful for the economy to move on. Then we need to have a proper discussion about um, uh, the social aspects of it and have regulations that are targeting the social aspects of it. I think it's highly uh, recommended to have much more age verification controls. Um, I would argue for many other social uh, regulations as well when it comes to uh, when it comes to platforms, uh, simply because I think that would be part of addressing some of the problems that we've seen arising with, with the platforms. Um, and finally, I think I would advise businesses, regulators, and others to get together to develop standards for how to, in practice, deal with some of the issues that we are talking about in regulations. For instance, what, what type of standard should we apply when it comes to competition on a platform? Um, if we now think, for instance, that Apple is charging too much for sales in its app stores, so what should the standard be? What is a reasonable fee to pay for it? And I don't think you can come with heavy-handed regulation to determine that because it's going to differ from platform to platform and it's going to differ over time depending on, on how services are changing. Um, so having a price, command and control type of regulation by, by government, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, it's not going to achieve the outcome. And having sort of more space for, uh, for the development of different standards, I think here could be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are ready two minutes uh, past our time. So I would like to thank everyone for the amazing contributions to this debate. Again, Ms. Katarzyna Szymilewicz, president of Panoptykon Foundation, Marcin Krasucki at Google, Marta Pawlak, Startup, uh, Startup Poland, and Frederick Eriksson from Eastside. Thank you all very, very much.